All right, thank you. I appreciate the uh, the introduction there and the opportunity to come and speak this morning to everybody. I hope everybody's having a great day. Uh, middle of the week here. We're almost I'm almost ready for a weekend. Um, so again, my name is Ryan Byers. I'm the owner of Front Range Compliance Services. Um, I was asked to come to put some presentation together. So I figured on a DOT update, some of the regulatory stuff that's going on. It's been a busy couple years uh, since 2020. We've had uh, some, some pretty big changes to the DOT rules and regulations so I wanted to provide some information on that but predominantly I wanted to focus on the commercial motor vehicle maintenance program now there my contact information is on the slide again my my email info at frontrangecompliance.com will direct that email to the appropriate person if you've got something directly for me please feel free to come and ask a question you can also go to our website at uh, frontrangecompliance.com and with that just a quick introduction about me for those of you who don't know me i'm the owner of front range compliance founder of dot university um i was a previous colorado state trooper i i worked for the colorado state patrol motor carrier safety section i started off my career out in western colorado as a trooper working the road and uh I got interested in trucks. Uh, I ended up promoting um, and moving into the motor carrier safety section. I moved to Denver and joined that where I did roadside inspections for the first year. And then I became a compliance investigator and then I became a trainer for the state and a, a master trainer for the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And about 10 years ago after CSA hit, I decided, you know what, it's time to kind of hang it up and move away from uh, the enforcement and it's time to start working with the industry so with that you know prior to that i was a police officer sheriff's deputy out in the western slope uh, before that when i got home from college I, I did some logging i worked in the trucking industry i learned a lot about trucking uh, during that time like we learned all we hauled all of our heavy machinery in the middle of the night later on when i became a state trooper i found out why we were hauling all of our machinery in the middle of the night and then I grew up on a, a cattle ranch out in western Colorado in a little community called Pea Green, that kind of thing. Now, just a quick little bit about my company, just so you all know, we do provide resources for you. We are a company that can help you with your DOT compliance. If you're struggling, if you need a little bit of help with some of this stuff, you can find us on YouTube or Rumble at DOT University. Just do a simple search. You find us on there. Got some great training videos on some of these really frequently asked questions, things that are, are available for you. Um, to reference there there we try to put out some really helpful information there so please feel free to check us out use us there and then you can check us out if you want some help with compliance drug and alcohol testing programs um, you know if the IRP you name it where we we do the DOT compliance stuff so you can find us at that website frontrangecompliance.com uh, um, that's about all I'm gonna do for plugs for my company I just wanted to get that out there so everybody knows how to find us and, and how to utilize uh, the services that that we provide so our training topics today I've got a full pack time frame for you so I'm gonna talk to you about some commercial motor vehicle maintenance programs because every company struggles in this field I'm also gonna be talking about the entry-level driver training that's brand new this year February 7th 2022 this went into play it's gonna affect each and every one of us um, in the industry so I want to make sure that I'm getting you some good information uh, for that if in just in case you need it I am also going to talk a little bit about the FMCSA clearinghouse completing your queries um, there are many companies that are still not doing their queries not um, involved in that FMCSA clearinghouse and the violations are going out left and right. So uh, I wanna make sure I get you that information. And last, I wanna to talk to you about the hours of service, the short haul operation. You know, uh, that update in uh, uh, September 29th of 2020, when that went into effect, it really did change the game for the local companies like you. But I just wanna make sure that you're using that, that, that hours of service uh, exception correctly so you don't get yourself in trouble from there now when it comes to vehicle maintenance programs words to avoid the DOT doesn't require that the, the FMCSA requirements are really open to interpretation um, 
but what does it really mean? Does it mean the alphabet service schedule? You know, you, you get a maintenance person that comes in and they say, oh, we do the A service, the B service, the C service, the D service. You know, it just goes on and on and on forever. Maybe that's a good program. Maybe it's not. Is it a 5,000 mile interval service or, or 250 hour service? Again, maybe, maybe not. Is it an annual service? The, the point that you have to get into is when it comes to your vehicle maintenance programs, the preventative maintenance program that you have to have is the schedule that fits your uh, your fleet what is required so so when we get to the regulations that talk specifically about the vehicle maintenance program that's going to be in the DOT regulations in part 396.3 and it starts off it says every motor vehicle and motor carrier must systematically inspect repair and maintain or cause to be systematically inspected repair and maintained all of the vehicles subject to their control. So what that basically means is that is if it's owned, leased, or used by you, you either have to do the maintenance or you gotta make sure somebody else is doing the maintenance but it's got to be done. It doesn't say what maintenance to do. It means all maintenance. Everything that's required per the regulations has got to be satisfactory at all times and up to par. So you have to find the, 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 the maintenance program that works best for you. For example, um, your company could be, be stationed in Golden, Colorado. Let's just say you're a smaller company with, say, 10 trucks. And, you, you know, you've got five trucks that go west every day out to Grand Junction and back. And you've got five trucks that go out to Sterling and back every day. Um, when it comes to your fleet, those two different maintenance programs are going to be completely different. You know, hopefully you would say, well, we're going to use the same trucks to go to Grand Junction every day and the same trucks to go somewhere like uh, Sterling every day. Because again, as you're managing those brakes, the brake repairs, you know, part of that fleet is going to have a substantially different brake wear program due to the mountain passes and that kind of thing. So the point that I'm trying to make is that you go through and you identify what maintenance program that you need that's going to keep your trucks rolling and and be safe out there on the roadway the first part that it comes into this regulation it says parts and accessories shall be in safe and proper working condition at all times these include those specified by part 393 that is the regulation of all the parts and accessories necessary for safe operation including but not limited to the uh sorry i lost my place in the, the regulation uh parts and accessories affect safety including but not limited to the frame the frame assembly suspension axles uh, attaching parts wheels rims um and uh, steering systems so again all those accessories and everything else that's listed in there if you are running some some motor coaches if you're running you know uh, passenger carrying vehicles then uh, you also additionally have to have the emergency exit inspections so when we return back to that phrase the dot doesn't require that for instance i had a company one time that i was working for and we built out a beautiful maintenance program and this company had about 50 trucks and their on-road performance was terrible. Every time they were going through a roadside inspection, they were getting put out of service or they were getting violations. And it was just, they were, they were over the maintenance threshold for years. So we went in and we built out a maintenance program. It was an aggressive program, but they went for the next year and a half to two years. They got 19 roadside inspections and they went from having two to three to 10 violations every inspection to for a year and a half, they didn't have a single violation. And then something happened in that company. All of a sudden I was I started, you know, we had kind of drifted apart. I wasn't really helping them anymore because we had we'd kind of had cured their program. They were they were doing good. And all of a sudden they called me, Ryan, we got some problems again. The maintenance manager that was there left. He went somewhere else. They brought in a new maintenance guy. And that's the one thing I've learned about the maintenance people. Everybody knows everything, right? And this guy walked in and he looked at the maintenance program and this is his exact quote oh the dot doesn't require all that you just have to do this this and this okay well we just read what the dot requires and it doesn't say that you have to do this this and this it says that you have to do whatever you need to do to keep your trucks in good working order and legal out there on the roadway so this maintenance manager went through and, and did made his changes to the whole fleet and for the next two and a half close to three years this company 
was back in the toilet with their safety scores and they just could not get back on top of it because it took a lot of work to get that whole program built back and brought back into up to par so again like i said it's clear a clear preventative maintenance program has a different meaning to each person so what you have to do is you got to come up with the schedule that works for you you have three possible schedules that you can work from the first one is going to be what i would refer to as the preventative maintenance full service schedule that full service schedule is, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, but that is you're, you're doing everything, you're fixing everything all of the time. And then you have the second one, that's going to be the plan money spent schedule. This is where you go through, you plan your, your program, you plan where you're, you're going to be at with it, and that's going to be the plan service. And the last one is going to be the procrastination maintenance schedule that you have out there. Now we're talking about that full service maintenance program. That's completing inspections on your entire fleet, all units, all trailers, and you're completing Completing the repairs on anything and everything in sight that is showing wear on that. Does that, you know, I, I gotta ask, does that sound like a good idea? Does any of anybody out there have any reservations with that? You know, I would think if you have some experience with this, you know, you would probably have some concerns with that because it's like giving the maintenance department, you know, full control of your checkbook. You know, they're they're constantly spending nonstop and, and it can get a little bit expensive. So the next one, we talk about that planned money spent schedule with this one you're planning what you're going to be spending money on you've got your you know we're going to do this many inspections in this quarter or this many inspections throughout the year this is what we're expecting to fix this is what we're going to going to be doing that's great if you have a really good tracking system in place and you know exactly what you're going to be spending your money on but a planned money spent schedule requires you to be extremely organized. Unfortunately, what happens with a lot of companies is they just plan on saying, hey, we're just going to do this, this, and this, and no other. But there's no rhyme or reason why they're fixing what they are. And then some of the other parts and accessories start to fail and cause problems. And this is kind of known as a known budgeted maintenance, um, you know, something like that. Um, and how many you're knowing how many hours you're going to need, how many hours are going to be spent by your inspections, by your service, by your technicians. The typical plan to manage your service repair, an example of doing this, would be like an A and a B service. You know exactly when you're going to do it and the time frame that you're going to do it. The last preventative maintenance program that, that we can talk Talk about out there is the procrastination maintenance schedule now that procrastination maintenance schedule you know overall it's it's a good thing um, you know we're we're not gonna fix it yet we're gonna let that part and accessory ride out just a little bit longer I think we can get some more wear on it and a lot of times that works so it's managed procrastination right we're making repair decisions only when absolutely necessary and I think that's the majority of what most companies do um, it, but again, this takes a lot of communication in the shop. You're using parts and equipment <clears throat> until their point of failure um, while trying not to compromise safety. So you kind of go through and you figure out, for instance, like on tires, you would say, you know what, on steering axle tires, we have to have four thirty seconds. On all other tires, we have to have two thirty seconds. So maybe you run your, your steering axle tires to six thirty seconds, and then you replace them anytime they're at or below six thirty seconds when it comes in for a preventative maintenance schedule <clears throat> you know um, and the same thing with the, uh, the all the other tires maybe you would look at it and say you know what it's two thirty seconds so we're going to run them to four thirty seconds and that's our point of repair uh and and moving that tire out there but unfortunately a lot of companies they run them until they're flat right run them until there's there's no tread no nothing left and they they, they just hope they just don't get caught but then they can't understand why their safety scores are constantly going up and up you your pre ma preventative maintenance plan it's got to be we're going to run things until they're right at that limit and then we got to change them so typically when it comes to a preventative maintenance program typically the decision making is left to one individual that's usually like the shop manager the fleet manager or whomever that is with the company but you have to remember with that type of a program you have to make sure that you are having very good communication with your shop personnel so everybody knows exactly when the points of uh, repair are going to kick in now i would say that a successful preventative maintenance program is going to be a mashup 
of all three of these possible schedules. We need a little bit of both to go on um, kind of with that thing. So our program goals, number one, we need quality and consistent inspections. So if, you, if you're going back and you're taking this information back to your shop, I want you to use this as a guide. What are you doing? Look at your programs and say, how does our preventative maintenance schedule work, right? And you, you gotta figure out your goals. What is a successful goal uh, in a preventative maintenance program? Well, your goal should be we're gonna get from one service to the next service with no downtime and no, no breakdowns, uh, no violations in between. That's your successful goal. So to get to that point, we number one, we got to have good quality inspections, consistency of those inspections. After the inspections are performed by personnel, then the necessary repairs are determined and made and we've got to decide on how to plan and spend our money on all the parts and the labor on that. So again, we've got to perform the inspection. And last, this is where the procrastination maintenance comes in. We've got a determination the option of repair or replacement of parts. Going back to my examples on tires, utilizing a tire. You know, if a tire comes in, let's say you set that threshold, that we're just gonna go through and we're gonna make sure that we repair, replace the steering axle tires at 6.30 seconds. So it comes in for its preventative maintenance schedule now and it's at just about six and a half, 30 seconds of tread depth. Well, now you gotta look at it and this is where the communication kicks in. You gotta say, okay, is there gonna still be enough tread between now and the next preventative maintenance schedule, right? So that's where it's really important to know how quickly your tires wear, how quickly do your parts and accessories wear out. And you know that by tracking that through all your past inspections, which is why it's so critical to document everything. Keep track of where those wear patterns are so you'll know. If you, For instance, if you know, you know what, if I'm at 630 seconds, I've got about a month and a half of using this tire and it's gonna be down below 430 seconds seconds okay well then you're gonna know hey you know what at that preventative maintenance if I don't expect to see this vehicle now um, you know for the until the next quarter so he's going uh, you know two and a half three months down the road before he comes back in for a preventative maintenance schedule you're gonna know you're, you that it's gonna be time to get that in that those tires repaired because you can't make it from one inspection to the next without having downtime right we want to keep that truck rolling that truck moving is what makes you money having downtime keeping it in the shop getting put out of service at roadside inspections that's what costs you money and that's what we've got to avoid now keep in mind no matter what your safety operation objectives right we've got to keep our drivers safe we've got to keep the motoring public safe and you know I know I'm using tires but they are absolutely critical they're what keep your vehicle on the road okay other than what the driver does so the goal, like I said, the goal preventative maintenance program is to complete the inspections on the trucks and on the trailers, okay? Probably the Achilles heel for all maintenance program is that trailer fee because when I sit down and I come into your office and we talk about your maintenance program, when I say what's the preventative maintenance schedule on your trailers, <clears throat> Yeah, it, it, it's fix it as we notice it or fix it as we become aware of it. And that's a major problem because I've seen the way your drivers are doing their pre-trip inspections and they're not noticing it. So, you know, that's kind of one of those things that, you know, I'd like to believe that your maintenance technicians, them doing an actual inspection, they're going to notice a lot more things that a driver does. So you've got to make sure trucks and trailers come in for that. I recommend if you're using tra trailers heavily, that trailer, if it's constantly hooked up to the truck, it goes through a PM schedule with the truck. If you've got a fleet of trailers and you're dragging and dropping them, then you're gonna have to have somebody designated to walk those trailer fleets, look at those trailer fleets, and make an attempt to at least get them in once a quarter to review them and make sure they're good. If you wait until somebody tells you that you've got stuff wrong or things that are broken on it, it's going to be too late and and uh, you're going to start getting some, some violations and taking some serious hits for your on-road performance. Okay. Okay. Understanding your maintenance intervals, tracking the constant wear and tear 
of your CMV fleet and your components is absolutely vital. Like I said, I've already mentioned it. This is where it helps you with your procrastination schedule because as long as you're tracking all of that work, all the previous maintenance and what the wear and tear is, whether it be on your brakes, or whether it be on your drums and your rotors, your brake adjustment measurements, your tire tread depth, hubs, battery, okay, all of these parts that have natural wear and tear to them, you're going to know, look, this is how long it typically lasts in our fleet with the way we use our vehicles. So you're going to know, can I make it from this PM to the next PM? Okay, um, without downtime in the middle, right? Because if you got to stop, if you do a PM every every two months or every two and a half months, it's somewhere in the middle. You got to shut that truck down for a day to redo all the brakes. Well, then that's unsuccessful. Now we we should have done that while we had the truck on the floor doing that preventative maintenance schedule, not midstream, not mid uh, between the two schedules, because now you got downtime and that truck is costing you money. Now it's not out there making you some money to try to earn that back so understanding your maintenance intervals part of that is knowing the life cycle of each of these components so what are you doing what are you writing down to track so that you can budget for your upcoming changes and and for the timing of the replacement of these worn components and and those parts okay so break time brake wear timeline an example you know is to go through and keep your your brake wear now just before we started this i did supply some handouts um to kathy to put up and she's probably got those there one of the handouts that i put up was the the brake wear indicator um you know you could take that that's just an example you know you can utilize that uh, or you can just use that maybe as a template to build your own into your process. But I walk in, I have reviewed thousands of maintenance programs through the years. And I go in, never do I ever walk in and look at a, a, a maintenance program and see where the fleet is tracking their brake measurements. I see we're tracking tire treads. I see we're doing stuff like that. But very rarely do I ever see anybody tracking their brake wear. Okay, and I think I know why, and I'm gonna come back to that here in just a minute. So we're gonna talk about the complete and, and the installation of all the brake components on the tractor. Okay, and this is gonna be kind of an example of, a, of an interval. And I'm, I'm gonna use brakes because they're probably one of the main topics that get a lot of company that are using air brakes um, in some hot water with the DOT and with their their safety scores so I'm gonna utilize this so so first off using a brake wear time lighting what you need to do is once you go through and you have a complete brake install on your trucks you've replaced everything the drums the s cams the rollers the linings okay everything is a brand new it's basically a brand new brake so from there you go through through your preventative maintenance intervals you record all your brake adjustments okay with time whatever the time would be okay when that brake was a brand new brake the push rod traveled out to about seven eighths of an inch to one inch that that would be normal that's where that automatic slack adjuster is setting that brake at now with time what that brake does is as it ages that automatic slack adjuster reset grows so it's no longer at an inch now it's maybe out to an inch and three quarters okay on a cold brake and this is where a lot of like a lot of brake technicians say oh you got to adjust the brakes and i'm telling you right now i'm going to harp on this one a few times here coming up we've got to make sure if you've got a brake technician that's adjusting brakes unless that truck is older that trailer's older than 1994 and have manual slack adjusters if it's got automatic slack adjusters and your company is still adjusting brakes um, as part of your preventative maintenance you're going to kill somebody because you're not fixing the brake okay and i'm going to talk a little bit more about that here coming up so you have got to stop that practice as that brake wears that automatic slack adjuster moves out and it becomes it grows to a point and it's communicating with you it's saying it's it's letting you know i need service there's something in that brake that needs service the next bullet point that i have on here it says that it's an indication of where it's developed within that brake as that slack adjuster moves out. What you have to do is we have to repair the worn components. Okay, it could be a component, it could be a roller, a bushing, could be the S cam, could be the slack adjuster, but nine times out of ten, it's something inside that brake is worn. You repair that and that brake, that slack adjuster, will return and maintain a measurement of about one inch at that one inch position, okay? So we talk about tracking the brake. So this is right out of Appendix G, okay? Uh, for, we should say formerly known as Appendix G. It is now Part 396, Appendix A. They moved it um, in December of 2021, right before the, the year end. 
So what, what we, when we read the automatic brake adjuster, number one, it says it's going to be in violation if that brake fails to maintain its stroke within the specified limit of the manufacturer. Okay, so you go out, you do the brake inspection. You know, if it's a type 30 brake, it's allowed to go up to two inches, but no further than two inches. Okay, um, so if it's beyond two inches, then it's out. But if you do a cold brake inspection, and it's at an inch and seven eighths. This is where the procrastination med schedule kicks in. If a cold brake is sitting at an inch and seven eighths, yes, it's not out of adjustment yet. But when that brake heats up, okay, things expand in there. It's going to go out of adjustment while that driver is driving it. So when you're thinking about that procrastination schedule, now if I'm noticing that that cold brake, that slack adjuster, is automatically resetting at an inch and seven eighths, it's due for a brake service. Something's got to be replaced and repaired inside that brake, okay? Number th number two says an automatic brake adjuster that's been replaced with a manual. That would be a failure. A lot of companies, that, we're not really seeing that as much anymore. I see it, be honest with you, and hope I'm not picking. I, I am a country boy. I am from the country, so I feel like I can say this without offending too many people. But I tend to see this more as I move out into the country where they don't really have a whole lot of inspectors out there so you see somebody swap out manual adjusters or auto adjusters with manual if you've done that within your fleet take them off put them back into the auto it is a requirement if your truck and trailers are newer than 1994 okay the uh the next thing is damaged loose or missing components okay that's kind of the obvious parts but point number four is absolutely vital and i know it's a lot of information on this slide but i want to break this statement down okay point number four says any brake that's found to be out of adjustment upon the initial inspection must be evaluated and determine why the automatic brake adjuster is not functioning properly it's got to be evaluated determine why Okay. And then it goes on and, and it says the problem must be corrected in order to pass the inspection. And then the next sentence says it is not acceptable to manually adjust an automatic brake adjuster without first correcting the underlying problem. Okay, so that's why why I'm kind of harping on this one because this is a major major problem for companies out there and for maintenance technicians. I talk to maintenance technicians all the time, and one of the questions I ask them is like, "Hey, okay, you bring in a truck, you measure it's a Type 30 brake, brake comes in, it's at uh, two inches, two inch brake measurement uh, on that pushrod travel. What do you do? Well, I adjust it. Every one of them. I get a room full of mechanics. Damn near every one of them adjust it. Okay, uh, and that's got to stop. Now, when we talk about your brake measurements, for instance, okay, this is something a lot of guys don't even know that. I I teach mechanics. I teach classes to them, uh, especially for the the periodic inspection certifications. Um, and I'll get a room full of maintenance technicians that are doing brake adjustments, that are doing brake services, and doing annual inspections. And I'll ask them. I'll say, hey, you know, what's the most common type of, of brake that's on there? And most most of them know that it's going to be a type 20 and type 30 on a, on a truck. That's going to be type 20s usually on the steer and 30s all around. Maybe you got 24s on the steer. It doesn't matter. These are the most common brakes that we have out there. But then I'll ask them, what is the maximum push rod travel? And very seldom do I get the right answers from this. So this is like a chart like this would be spectacular to have printed up on a poster size, you know, in your office, something like that in your shop so that these guys know what these push rods are. And if you're doing a procrastination schedule, you're going to say, hey, we're at break service. Our company break service. When we're at an inch and three quarters, that, that break gets service. That'd probably be a good idea, no matter what the break is because that automatic slack adjuster should be carrying those brakes at one inch so this chart just basically goes through and shows us that if we're, we're utilizing a type 20 it's going to say that we have an inch and three quarters um, if it's a long stroke, we're going to have two options as a two to two and a half. And that depends. It's on the tag on this. Now, I could talk about brakes for this entire time. I just kind of wanted to show you this to give you an example of this overall program. Now, we talk about brake failure in the maintenance. Again, I'm, I'm taking an overall maintenance program. And right now, I'm just focusing on the tracking of the brake failure components. Number one, I chose it because it's such a vital component in keeping your driver safe. But number two... It's just constantly a violation out there. So I'm using brakes for that. Now on this chart, utilizing a automatic slack adjuster is what I have right over here, okay? And using a chart that is measured out 
up to three inches. Of course, this is not to scale, but this is just a demonstration of how this works. Position one, right here, position one, that is going to be a one inch push rod travel, usually set up on a newer brake or a properly functioning brake. This automatic slack adjuster will come back in and it'll have an automatic restart. So when the air is activated inside this, this, uh, this brake chamber, as that push rod pushes out, on a normal, good, cold brake with good brake function, it's going to come out here right about position one, one inch. As that brake ages, it's going to push out a little bit further. Now, this red line that I have right here, okay, this is a demonstration of the braking force that you're getting in that brake. You can see when we're at position one, we're at maximum maximum braking efficiency. We're at position two, we start to drop a little bit because again, we're pushing that push rod out. We're at position three, we're dropping greatly. When we get to position four, I'm gonna call that the point of no return at that point, okay? So position number P2 right there, that's about uh, an inch and a half worth of travel, P2. So again, we're still in there, but when, between P2 and P3, somewhere in that area on that automatic adjuster, when you're tracking your brake measurements, that's when that preventative maintenance schedule's got to kick in somewhere in this area and say, okay, we got to open up that brake, we got to figure out what those components are, and we got to bring that automatic slack adjuster right back to this position one. Okay, and you're only going to do that by replacing the components. Now, if you do an automatic, if you manually adjust an automatic adjuster, okay, and you're, let's say you're sitting out here at position three, P3, okay, that's max travel. So you go through and you do an automatic brake adjustment, okay, and when you do that, that brings it right back here to position one, okay. What happens as soon as that truck leaves your yard, okay, within about a quarter of a mile to a half a mile, every time he hits the brakes, that automatic brake adjustment adjuster just pushes itself back out okay he gets going down by the time he hits the highway he's right back here so you went through and thought that you fixed this truck and fixed this trailer so he had good brakes and in all reality you didn't you lied to him you're still putting him in a truck now with no brakes or potentially it's going to be losing the brakes okay because once that brake heats up he's going to be somewhere out here and I'm not willing to bet the farm that he's going to be safe out here once he gets out here. So again, we have to go through and fix those brakes to try to keep him somewhere in this area, position one, at least not out to position three. It's absolutely critical that you're doing those absolute good brake repairs. Okay, kind of continuing on to this automatic slack adjuster. These devices do not account for slack caused by worn and faulty components. I've kind of already said that. But again, it could be your drum wear. Look, if your drum is out there and, and it feels like it's got a handle on the inside of it because it's worn so much, you got to replace them. Okay, if your mechanics are telling you, well, we only do our brakes at 30 PSI because that's called dynamiting the brakes. Personally, I would fire any mechanic that comes to me and tries to justify the term dynamiting the brakes. That's that's the phenomenon of when the you apply 90 to 100 pounds of pressure to the drum or to the brakes and the, the brake drum actually flexes a little bit. Okay, and it forces the, the vehicle out of adjustment. If your brake drum is flexing, that's an out of service condition. That that drum has worn too much. Okay, so when you get a mechanic talking about dynamiting the brakes, I, I'd seriously probably just say, hey, you need to hit the road, dude. Um, yeah, or get them retrained because that's that's ridiculous. Okay, and a mechanic who argues to stay non-compliant and so he doesn't have to do work isn't a good mechanic. Shouldn't be part of your maintenance program. Okay, same thing with the, the manager. So those of you listen to me, if you catch yourself arguing of why you should stay non-compliant, you probably ought to rethink your your position there okay or at least take a different approach okay and the next thing that we get to is the manually adjusting automatic slack adjusters again i've already talked about that it's going to give that driver a sense of security thinking that his brakes are good but in all reality they're not he's going to be in violation okay next thing manual adjustment then automatic slack adjuster it's going to reposition when he comes back out there now one of the forms that i gave you is this thing this is going to be the air brake wear for timing and tracking Okay, um, and, or tracking and timing. Now, when we go through and we, we look at this with that air brake wear, again, by date, each of the brakes, what are your measurements? So as you're going through and you're looking at this, so on July 6th of this many miles, we can see where all of our brakes are. And just kind of using this, this Type 24 long, okay, 
talk about the regulation stroke that it's allowed to have, you can see that with time, it, it started off at, at uh, an inch and a half, then it went to an inch and three quarters, and now it's out here at this two inch marker. So you can see somewhere in there with this preventative maintenance, at this time now, before that truck leaves the shop floor, we've got to fix that. The procrastination schedule has gotten us to this point, we got to pull it back in. So you, it's so important to know what your wear times are on your brakes for the routes that you take or the type of driving that you're in so that you know when you've got to do that preventative maintenance. Like we have to service that brake now because it's pushing out at an inch and seven eighths. It doesn't have enough brake to get it between now and the next brake inspection, okay, or the next PM schedule. Because if I try to take it that long, then somewhere midstream, the driver's going to be writing up DVIRs. Hey, the brakes are feeling squishy. Hey, the brakes aren't working. I need to get the brakes adjusted. And your mechanics are adjusting the brakes, but yet you adjust the brakes and every day you're right back out there. So again, manage your, your time. When we talk about brake inspectors, they are required to be qualified. So what have you done to ensure sure that the, the people that you're employing, the people that are working in your program, that they are properly qualified to perform these periodic, um, or not periodic, these, these brake inspections. Okay, just because the individual's been turning wrenches for, for years upon years, that doesn't make them qualified. They might be really great mechanics, but they don't understand the fundamental components of a DOT program and the requirements, okay? Mechanic after mechanic is still adjusting brakes out there. That's why I'm talking about this. That's why I'm harping on this. I mean, if we didn't learn anything from the events of, of April 2019 when that truck came barreling down the highway and crashed out there because he had brake problems, he, I mean, there was a lot of other things that went wrong, you know, training, um, experience, you name it, but brake problems were part of that, okay? Uh, you know, we wanna make sure that we're doing a part so we don't also get into a crash as related to a brake failure or something like that so we have got to learn from others mistakes and make sure that we're on top of this okay when we come back and we look at 396.25 this is the qualifications okay again we've got to make sure that our brake inspectors are qualified okay ask them walk up to them say hey when you're doing your brake inspections inspections and you find a brake at about two inches what do you do just ask them. Don't don't give them the answer. When they tell you they're doing brake adjustments, you have got to get them retrained, okay? Um, I would not. I wouldn't terminate them. I wouldn't discipline them. They just have a bad process in their head, and they have got to be retrained. But they are not qualified to work on your brakes if they're just adjusting the brakes. Technicians who simply adjust brakes, every service. Like they bring it in, I crawl underneath the brake, I pull out my 7 sixteenths wrench, I tighten that brake all the way down, back it off a half a turn. Okay, yeah, that, that person is not qualified. That is not the proper procedures for an automatic slack adjuster. It is for a manual slack adjuster, but not an automatic one. Drivers, they should be encouraged to check their brakes, okay? Visually inspect them, check them to make sure that upon the brake application, make sure they don't have excessive pushrod travel, but drivers should and must not be permitted to perform brake adjustments, okay? There are a lot of drivers out there, old school, that think they're good. Now, when it comes to doing the annual inspections, okay? The annual inspection is probably one of the most important inspections out there, and it's a vital part of your overall um if your overall maintenance program. So with that, the periodic maintenance inspection program, that periodic annual inspection's gotta be performed at least once annually. Now, I love that it's required at least once annually, but I'm like, if that's such a great inspection, why are we doing it just once annually? You know, I've got some some programs that I work with that I learn from, and their their procedure is, is you know what, we renew the annual every time that truck is on our shop floor. It doesn't take that long to do an annual inspection. It's the repairs that take the longest. But as long as we're keeping up with it and we're fixing those repairs throughout the year, we don't have a lot of downtime. So they'll they'll knock out a new annual every quarter, every time that vehicle's sitting on their shop floor. Now, if that's too much for you, okay, then I would say, how about have a policy that says, hey, anytime our annual's within six months of expiration, we're gonna renew that annual, do that inspection. And here's the deal, every time you're working on a vehicle, if it's on your shop floor, before you release it to go out into the world and work, you should be doing a full-on inspection on it to make sure that the and all those parts and accessories and everything's in good working order. If you're not, you're missing the boat um, because you got to make sure that all those accessories 
are good. Okay. Um, one of the most important inspections is that this DOT maintenance program, but it is often overlooked. It is often taken for granted, and oftentimes the reports are just pencil whipped. Okay. I, I know maintenance locations. I'm not going to tell you who they are and where they are, but you know I've gotten calls from the feds because they've, some of their inspectors have been through my training, and they're, those guys are doing 60 annual inspections a day, and they're doing it for a commercial operation. So you know what? I figure you could sit down and fill out about 60 of those reports a day, but they're not going hands-on. They're not doing an inspection on a single one of those vehicles. And they're charging like $125 a report. Now you do the math. If you're doing 60 a day at $125 a pop, and you're doing that day in and day out throughout the year, yeah, you're making a pretty penny, okay? The problem is, is none of those trucks are actually annual inspected. They're just pencil whipped. Okay, the next thing, general preventative maintenance inspections are similar to the annual, okay, but they don't re replace it. So we just say when you do the annual, you want to make sure that you get in there and take it that next step and make sure that it's good. Now, every periodic inspector should have every periodic inspection whenever that vehicle goes through there should have a list of repairs so when you go back and you double check your maintenance program pull out the annual inspections and look at them what was performed and what was done make sure that it is uh you see the repairs then there you know if you don't see any repairs two weeks before or two weeks after a vehicle went through i'm going to tell you right now it's probably pencil whipped unless your trucks are that good of shape okay if they're not making the repairs they're missing it. The other things that you're going to notice is when you go through, if you have a truck that goes through one of your most recent periodic annuals and they're stopped, you know, next day, within a week or two, and you're seeing defects that are listed, defects that should have been identified in that periodic inspection, you had probably better open up an internal investigation within your program to figure out just exactly where that breakdown was in that process. So again, make sure that you're you're on top of this. The feds are really cracking down on annual inspectors, so make sure you're there. Now, when we talk about inspector qualifications, okay, what have you done to ensure that the, your inspectors, your guys that are doing your annuals, are qualified? Okay, are they properly trained? Do they have years of experience? Okay, just because they have years of experience doesn't make them qualified. They have to be familiar. They have to know the rules. They have to know the procedures for the inspection. Okay, not just how to fix stuff. They got to know the inspection procedures for the annuals. Okay, what do you do within your program to ensure that your maintenance technicians are qualified? Have you put them through a, some type of a training program? I know at CMCA they offer a class. I come out and teach a six hour class. I teach the class at CMCA, it's just a shorter version. Um, we do a class at your yards where we we go hands-on with a vehicle and we actually demonstrate inspection procedures that, that are required. Um, we identify, you know, have you gone through and identified who your leaders are within your maintenance program um, and to provide a training to help teach those younger uh, mechanics, those inexperienced technicians to help them uh, achieve uh, a, a certain level of uh, qualification within your program. And then again, we talk about initial recurrent training when it comes to 49 CFR Appendix A, what those procedures are. Okay. The next thing that part of your maintenance program that you've got to really be on top of, and that's going to be the driver vehicle inspections. Okay. Every day, the drivers have got to go out and do their inspections. How are your drivers doing it? What kind of checks and balances do you have in place to ensure that they're doing a good inspection? Okay. All right. So driver vehicle <laughs> inspection, when we come to that, okay, the drivers have got to perform these every day. Okay. We've got basically five inspections that's got to be done by that driver. The first one is going to be that pre-trip inspection. Okay. Every day before they operate or every time they hook up to a new trailer, they have got to do that pre-trip inspection. Okay. And, uh, it, it's got to be done, and they've got to document any defects that they find, okay? They've got to prepare, perform an emergency equipment inspection of the triangles, the fire extinguisher, and of the spare fuses. Make sure that they're there and they're present uh, and that type of thing. They've got to perform a cargo securement inspection. Every time they load and unload, they're required to make sure that that cargo is good. Every time they're stopped, they're required to always do a cargo uh, inspection to make sure that their cargo is good. Number four talks about a routine visual. I call this the always be looking. When they stop and they get their morning breakfast burritos or their lunch for the day or their energy drinks, whatever they need to do, 
get in the habit of constantly be looking at that vehicle, its components, make sure they didn't have a tire go flat, make sure they didn't have a, a hub start leaking, whatever the case could be. Okay, always be looking. And then lastly, at the end of every one of their shifts, those drivers have got to be doing a post inspection um, just to make sure, again, that tire is good. Now, when you look at it, like I get companies that call me and say, Ryan, does the driver really have to do a post trip inspection? Yeah, you do. And think about it from a management standpoint. Wouldn't you want a post-trip inspection? No, for certain today, like I got a nail in a tire and it's going flat. Wouldn't you like to know about that at five in the afternoon rather than five minutes before they're getting ready to leave tomorrow for their trip? Absolutely. That post-trip inspection is 100% absolutely vital. Okay, so we come to the report. Okay, at the completion of operating a regulated vehicle, the, the driver must complete a DVIR indicating the safety defects and submit those for review. Now your DVIRs, they can be um, a, uh, a, an electronic DVR, they can also be a, uh, a paper, it's, it's totally up to you. We just gotta make sure that they're doing it and they're documenting it. All safety defects that are noted on there have to be addressed, anything noted on there has to be addressed by the mechanic, okay? Now communication is vital with this one because drivers sometimes like to write up things that aren't DOT safety and they'll write it up every day every day and your every day it gets written up your mechanic has to address it and it becomes time consuming so again get in there talk to your drivers talk to your mechanics let them know look if it's something that we're going to get fixed air conditioner is a big one right and there's no dot requirement no safety requirement for an air conditioner i grew up in the country we had wing windows growing up and we survived i tell the driver hide uh, you know what hydrate well We'll get it fixed when it comes in for the next preventative maintenance, but we're not going to put the vehicle down. If you want to take the vehicle down and out of service, get the air conditioner fixed, that's cool. That's up to you. But most companies will just kind of keep it, keep it going. But communicate with that driver so they don't just keep writing it up every day. Okay, so make sure that everything documented on the report is, is repaired. The next thing is, is your team utilizing DVIRs or are they doing the practice of just calling, walking around the vehicle and then calling up the shop? Hey, you know what? I need to get this fixed or calling you up. Maybe you're the manager. Hey, I need to get this fixed. Yeah, that's great. If you got one truck, you could probably keep up with it. But some of you guys got 50 trucks and you know what? Some of you got more, some of you got a little bit less. It becomes overwhelming. When the shop personnel gets 20 phone calls every morning, everything to get fixed, you know what? He's going to forget stuff. Stuff's going to get missed, and your drivers are leaving and driving with those broken components. You have got to get on top of that stuff, okay? And that's how where we can see and where we can track and keep up with that is having them write it down on that DVIR. That way we have a list, treat the DVIR like a repair order. I see companies that come in, they have a drive, they have the company fill out a DVIR, and they walk in the shop and they have them fill out a repair order. Why are we duplicating paperwork? Just have them do the DVIR, treat that paperwork as the repair order, send that to the mechanic, the mechanic then does their part and vice versa. We don't need to add any other additional paperwork. Okay. Now, is your team utilizing DVIRs or practice walking in? It was the topic here. Okay. Um, which is really common, um, you know, because DVIRs are difficult to track. DVIRs, drivers get to fill them out and they, they fill them out. Uh, what I love is they fill them out every day and every day it says the vehicle is good, but they're still calling the shop and saying, hey, we got to, I had to fix this. Make sure that you in that, that process, make sure your shop professionals know that if a driver walks in and says, hey, I got to get something fixed, that they can turn around and look at that driver and say, hey, that's great. We'll get right on that as soon as you hand us a DVIR. You have to utilize that DVIR. If not, it's really easy to get past that, become complacent, and then you're just not using it at all. Okay, and, and not using a DVIR is a critical violation. And that, like like many of the things that we've talked on here, these things can affect your overall safety rating of of the company. Okay, which if it affects your safety rating, that affects your insurance, that affects your ability to get contracts and work on certain jobs. So you've got to make sure that you're staying on top of this. Okay, without a DVIR, it's very difficult to identify where the breakdown is within that shop process. Now we talk about the DVIR our motor carriers you have two options you can do the standard daily reports or and that's going to be where you fill out a report every day on every vehicle driven or you can use option two which is the 2014 guidance okay and that's going to be with the paperwork reduction act there's no need to fill out that report every day there's still a need to do it all those inspections those five inspections i talked about but the paperwork 
only has to be filled out. If you use option two, the DVIR only has to be filled out when defects are found. Okay, so you, again, I, I'm really, I really like that process. Some people say I want the inspection every day because that way I know the driver did the inspection. Look, I can tell you right now from my experience, that driver did that inspection every day. That tells me no more than he spent a couple minutes in his shift filling out that piece of paper because I can go around and walk around your trucks and probably find things that are wrong. Okay. Uh, both options have their benefits. You just have to figure it out. And you've got, if you, either way you go, option one or option two, you just have to make sure you're doing it 100% correctly. Okay. Documentation, documentation of maintenance is absolutely critical in your vehicle maintenance programs. Maintenance spec technicians, y'all didn't get into this job job so that you could do paperwork. I get that. When I became a police officer, I didn't get into that business so that I could do paperwork either. I had no idea. Like they don't show that stuff, you know, in the Hollywood productions and the movies and stuff like that. You know, they, they just show you're chasing cars, you're, you know, arresting bad guys and this and that. They don't show you the hours that you spend typing up reports, but it is an absolutely critical and vital part of your job. So again, when it comes to the maintenance technicians, a maintenance technician is only as good as their paperwork. Remember that because if they don't document it in writing, it never happened, even if they're doing it. Uh, uh, when it comes to the court of law, and if you drive down the highway on every billboard, there's a lawyer's face, okay, they are out there to sue you. And those are the things that they're looking at. They're trying to find where your um, program, where you're having problems, where you're being negligent in your program, program. And if you are not documenting, that is most definitely one of those negli negligent tasks. All repairs have to be documented. Every time a, a mechanic goes hands-on onto a vehicle, I want it documented either in a computer program or on a piece of paper, what they touched, what they repaired. Even if it's just adding windshield washer fluid, I want that all documented. You have to have that uh, in your overall program. You can have a paper file or an electronic maintenance file. Your process is fine as long as you're, I can capture what was repaired on what day, okay? Every vehicle, every power unit, every trailer, converter dollar, um, uh, trailer, mobile equipment, all of that all has to have a vehicle maintenance log tracking the dates and the work intervals completed and a maintenance file that goes through and tracks all the records of inspection repair. That's the receipts. That's all the work that was done because the log says, hey, we did this on this date. The maintenance file shows the proof of what you did. It's going to it's going to stand behind that. We talk about your maintenance files. Each of your maintenance files have to be organized either electronically or paper file in your in your maintenance program. You have to identify the vehicles by the unit number, the year, the make, the VIN, and the tire size, okay? It can be either electronic or it can be on a paper tracking sheet. So we talk about the uh, document retention with that one. For 14 months, we've got to go through and keep the periodic uh, inspection reports. Each of those annual inspections that you do, you have to. The inspector qualifications for both periodic and break have got to be maintained for each maintenance technician that you have done on file. If you use a third party mechanic it is okay to ask them for their qualification documents so that you can put those in your file especially if you're using somebody all the time okay one year one year requirements all the records of repair and maintenance okay now i recommend dot says keep that for one year because you can do data cues for up to two years it's always good to have at least two years of records in there okay if you're a passenger carrier you have to have your records of emergency inspection emergency exit inspections in there for a year now 90 day requirement that's going to be those dvirs but hear me out on this one if i use that dvir as a repair order and it follows the process all the way through I would just keep that documents with the original repair records. I wouldn't worry about shredding it after 90 days, okay? If you're, if you're, you're pencil whipping them and they're all BS, I understand why you're, you're hanging out by the shredder as soon as 90 days pass so you can get rid of them. Okay, but like I said, um, as long as you're following that process right, especially if you use option two, I would just staple that to the overall uh, maintenance log, okay? Now, after you, you fire a vehicle from your fleet, you sell it, you get rid of it, whatever that case is, once you get rid of that vehicle, okay, what you need to do is keep the maintenance file for an additional six months, okay? Before I move into this next topic here, do I have any questions or anything off of a vehicle maintenance program? Kathy, can you let me know if anything popped up in the questions? 
I don't have any questions that came through, but now is a good time. Um, Ryan can take a breath because I know he safety score is. Okay. That's a really great question. And your DOC safety score, you have, you really have two potential options for that. We're, uh, we're swapping out some camera batteries real now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to exit out of this. I'm going to take you into to the, in the internet here and see if I can just kind of show you the process. Um, how I like to go through and utilize the safety scores is I, I start with safer so when you call me up and you're like, hey, Ryan, I want to talk to you. I got some questions um, or I want you to come and help us with our program. As soon as I get your company name, I'm coming into this, the Safer website. Okay. And that website is safer.fmcsa.dot.gov. And I come down here and I look this up. Now, whoop, I, I should have told you that I was clicking on there. When you scroll down. Okay, and you come to the middle column here, it says FMCSA searches, and you click on company snapshots. Okay, what that'll do there is then that's going to take you to this page where you can search for any company. You can search for them by their USDOT number or their company name. Just switch to which one you want to do. I'm going to type in a company here. They're, they're not a local company, but I'm going to use them. Now, this is all public information. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, you can search up everybody. I, I guarantee your competitors are looking up you when you're trying to get contractors contracts they're looking you up that kind of thing so you'll come in here you log in to the safer you enter in the company information and then it's going to pull up their record now let me kind of zoom in on this and kind of show you this so it comes through it gives you first off their basic snapshot of their company it'll come down it'll tell you what their violations are okay now this company is no longer in business or we'd see a lot more of their history so it's just kind of aging and stuff's dropping off of there but you can see that you have inspections here you've got uh, one inspection no out no out of service and it tells you where you want to be with your national average. You can see where you're at, how many inspections you had, and how many out of services you had, as well as you can track if you've had any crashes or the company you're looking up. From there, when you scroll back up to the top, right underneath this in this first little blue box, if you click on SMS results, that's going to take you to your CSA scores, your overall safety scores is your basics. And you can look at these basics each as individuals. A basic is a behavioral analysis and safety improvement category. That's the score that the feds keep on you. And those each one of these has thresholds that you're going to be going over. Now, you can log into this. If you hit this little login button right here, it'll pop up with a DOT number. Or you could put in your DOT number and your FMCSA PIN, and you can log in from there. I don't want to log into that company because once you log into it, it'll show you a little bit more confidential information. Um, but once you log in, it'll tell you if you're over one of these thresholds. Okay, It'll alert, and it'll have a triangle warning above them now you can like i said you can click on to see all your data or you can click on these individually to show you where they're at so just click on one individually you get a graph grid in here it's going to show you where your trend is you can see that this company was they were really high and then they just started now they're trending down well that's because they've been out of service they only have one inspection left on their record they used to have like 30 um but uh you know they went out of business a couple years ago so the the history's kind of dropping off but you can log into this and you can just kind of come in and see what your inspections are so if you come down as you scroll down right below the grid where you can see your history over time and it will take you back um, indefinitely so you can kind of see once you, you know especially if you log in you can see where your trends are and that kind of thing you can expand the view of this it's got a lot of really good information um, that you can get and maybe you have identified that you're trending at certain times a year or something like that so when you come down here you have violation summary you can click on that that'll break down just all your violations or you can do inspection history or you can do investigation results um, right in there just click on the plus and that'll expand it it'll show you your inspections and it'll show you the scores that they had and what their their overall weight of those scores were on your your safety safety rating so you see we've got one inspection he had a fuel tax violation uh, but that was nothing that uh, would affect the overall safety score. So, like I said, that's where you're going to go to check your overall safety scores. And again, if this if, if that's something that y'all could use a little bit of assistance with, you know, um, we're happy to to also help out with that. So, just give me a call.
Any other questions? And Ryan, can you just, yeah, just uh, tell us the URL of the Safer website that you went to? Yeah, absolutely. Let me jump back into that one more time. So Sorry was, about that. No. I was just going to put it in the question so people have that link there. Okay. Let me go back one more. So it's right there. FMCAA. So it's, so it's Safer. Backwards. Yeah, so Safer dot fmcsa dot dot g o v okay perfect so i just stuck that in the uh the questions box so you'll have that there and i think that was it somebody said thank you for answering that question absolutely absolutely okay i'm trying to find my presentation again here all right so the rest of this what i've got going on here for y'all is going to be just kind of a a regulatory update some kind of some hot topics some things that have been going on here recently um you know vehicle maintenance programs was something i really wanted to focus on and i really wanted to talk about those brake situations because it's a major problem i picked that topic because it's just it's non-stop um you know companies aren't getting with it but we have this new thing that hit us um here recently with uh, within the regulations and that was going to be the entry level driver training program now this program was going to hit two years ago uh, back on uh, fe in february of 2020 they they stalled it out they pushed it out okay i think people were hoping that they would do it again but they didn't they they decided to, to go ahead and move forward with it it's gonna it's gonna cause some havoc um uh, with that because it requires any boat new new person getting a cdl has to go through entry-level driver training program it's essentially like the driving schools it's forcing you to go to driving schools but it is giving you an option saying that you can build your own internal driver training program um and you sure can it's just that you know you have to certify you have to have the drivers you have to have a curriculum and your driver training program can be audited just like the dot safety is so if it becomes aware uh, feds become aware that you're doing some training and you're they've discovered you're not doing training there's going to be some big trouble so first off what is entry-level driver training the final rule so hopefully all y'all are out there that are listening to me today hopefully y'all have heard about this and you have some good information i'm hoping to make sure today i get you if this is the first time you're hearing of it um yeah i'm sorry don't don't shoot the messenger um i'm just here to, to kind of let you know if, if you've heard about it and or you've just heard rumors about it hopefully i can put some of those to, to rest as i'm going through and talking about this if you got questions jot them down so you remember to ask me at the end um because this is absolutely critical that everybody understands what's going on with this so what the, the, the entry level driver training was is the feds went through instead and set the the mandatory training for for entry level drivers okay it establishes the requirements of the training that they have to go through it also establishes the what they call the TPR the training provider registry and this is a an online uh, location that you could go to so you can find the trainers in your area as of right now pretty much everybody in there is going to be the CDL driving schools okay I mean they're they're loving this because it's forcing everybody to come to them where before you just had to go get your permit and then 14 days later you get your third party tester and then you could turn around from there and get the uh you know the the go through the training or go go through the testing and then you get your cdl now it requires a full-on driver training program okay um and so you go to the tpr you can find who your trainers are or if you're going to build your own training program internally so you can train new cdl drivers you have to self-certify your program in there get it registered and then you have to also register your instructors um, within there or the instructors have to register themselves now who needs entry-level driver that is anybody who wants to obtain either a class a or b cdl they have to go through entry-level driver training okay if you want to upgrade let's say you already have a class b but you want to get a class a okay you're going to have to go through and go through entry-level driver training or for those three endorsements okay if you've got an h endorsement a p endorsement or an s endorsement that's going to be required that you uh get uh, you go through entry-level driver training now what are the costs okay cdl schools okay they range anywhere from five thousand to about twelve thousand dollars so the xl driving school out in henderson they offer it they're at about five thousand there is a grant program that they accept it's it's the grant is a state of colorado grant 
um, and you can apply for it through Adams County. It's any Colorado resident. It's just managed through Adams County, and they accept that, and they will pay for your, your schooling at the XL Driving School. It's a really cool grant. There's a waiting list, though, so if you want to get on that, you're going to have to uh, to jump in there. I'm sure we're going to have some other people that are popping up and doing cheaper driver training, but uh, anyways, the C most of the CDL schools here in Colorado, when I called and priced them out, we're looking at anywhere from five dollars to $12,000, okay? So here's the deal. Who does this apply to? Anybody who got their CDL permit on or after February 22nd of 2022. If you have gotten it since that date or on that date, you are gonna be subject to entry-level driver training. If you got your permit beforehand, then you don't. Now, some of the common questions that I get right here are, you know, what, what if my permit, if I got it before and it expired, now when I renew it, do I have to go through? Um, I'd love to tell you you're good because you did originally get it before that date, meaning you took the written test to get the permit before before that date. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we just don't know. Uh, the state of Colorado has been radio silence on this topic. Um, we did reach out to them, and we've been told, no, you don't have to. As long as you took the test, you got your permit before. But I could foresee this being a problem. Just with state, uh, some of the states, the states the way they are. Okay. Next con question I've got is, well, what happens if my driver got a DUI and they lost their CDL and they were suspended for you know a, a few years or whatever, and then they come back and they try to get their CDL? Do they need to have it? Well, it all depends on the process. If they got to start over and go through all the testing, I would imagine that they're going to make them them redo it. If they just lost it and they renewed it as soon as it be they were eligible to renew, they won't have to to redo CDL. But if you if you let your CDL go for several years and then you come back to get it again, they're going to probably test you out and require you to go through that. Some of these questions we just don't have the answers to yet because it's a brand new system. I mean, it's not even a month old yet. Um, so we're there. So what does the training have to consist of? Two things, theory training and behind the wheel training. The first one, theory training, that's your classroom training. You can use a simulator in theory training, okay? Whereas behind the wheel training, simulators are forbidden. So like I said, with this, we've got uh, lectures, demonstrations, computer-based online training. You can go through and take the classroom training. Um, you know, JJ Keller is offering a, the theory training of that. And it, you can have two different instructors, an instructor to do the theory, and an instructor to do the behind the wheel. Remember, if you use two different instructors, they have to be done within a year of each other. So it's gonna be absolutely critical um, that you have it. Now the theory training is required that the driver, the student driver, passes that with an 80%. There has to be written thresholds. If you're gonna build your own training program, your program, your all of your training has to be built to match the curriculum that's required um, in these regulations. Um, and all the tests, all the paperwork, all the evaluations have to be maintained, as well as you have to have driver qualifications on that driver. Now the behind the wheel training, that's actual operation of the CMV. That can place, take place on a range. If you got property, you're gonna go out and drive on it. Um, or it can take place on the public road. Now if it's a range that's closed off to the public, you're pretty much free to do the training out there how you want, okay? If it's public road or have public access, then the, the rules of the road for permitting and riding with a permit driver, meaning anytime that vehicle's rolling with a student driver behind it, we have to have a licensed driver in there with them also. So with that, so keep that in mind. Now, uh, a simulator can't be used, and there is no minimum number of required hours for this training, either one of them. It's all about if the proficiency. So in the theory, the driver has to get an 80% behind the wheel. The driver has to demonstrate proficiency, and your instructor has to sign off on them. So if you're going to a driving school, then they'll sign off on them. If, you it in, if you're doing it internally, then your internally instructor signs off on them. Now, let's say you, you get the idea, hey, we can do this ourselves. We can just start the driving program. I'll sign off on them, and they're going to be good to go. If you didn't provide the, right, the good training to them and they go out and crash and kill somebody and you signed off and said they were proficient, they're going to be, Frank Azar is going to be coming back after you. So this opens up a Pandora's box of all kinds of new liabilities.
Okay. So with the entry level driver training require of testing providers, it provide it requires you to have the proper curriculum. It's going to require you to have the proper facilities. It's going to require you to have the proper instructors. Okay, your instructors have to have at least two years experience with the same CDL type and endorsements um, that that uh, that the this, this student is is trying to get. Okay, it's going to require state licensing to check and uh, validate the trainings before the driver can move on and it's going to require you to have vehicles for operation um, all of those different things now the entry-level driver training uh, providers beginning uh, the driver who sex successfully completes the training must electronically submit the driving training record so once you if you're do build your own program once one of your students completes that training by midnight of the second day after the training is completed you have to have that record uploaded into the state or, or into the federal the tpr the training provider registers that way that that student driver when they go to the state those records are can be be located on there the in the state driver's licensing authority can turn around and they can request uh again they can they can verify they're going to verify that the applicant has completed that training both the theory and the uh the behind the uh the wheel and then at that point then the uh the third party test can be done now your 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 cdl schools the way i understand this is when you go to them they're going to do it all in one bunch that way it's all completed uh, the paperwork all filled out so you can go back through your your student or your uh your program is not going to be registered with the state of Colorado to be a third party tester. So you would do the training, submit it. Once it's submitted, then the driver would go to the third party tester to get that portion of it done and then take that those records to the uh the state driver's license authority and and then they would get it from there so again like i said it's a bit of a process it's going to be a little bit of a, a nightmare so how does the training pre pre registry training provider registry support the entry-level driver training program okay it's going to be the training you're going to find your training that you have on there you're going to register as a trainer or you're going to locate a training provider drivers will locate there or you'll locate them for your drivers it's going to give you a place to submit your training records if you're a trainer um, or to self-certify your program that you are a training facility um, it's going to retain the documents that the person has passed but it's not going to require it's not going to retain all the documents that you're required I, I teach a little bit of a longer portion of this class where I run more in depth into that and I will let you know we are working on a, a curriculum that we can offer to, to people to use and we're going to do some instructor development so we can build some training uh, for small companies to be able to do some of this training in-house so we can help them with it we're working on it it's a bit of a process okay and lastly it, it's a place for the feds and the states to come through and retrieve those those overall records so entry-level driver training is kind of a big topic a lot of stuff going on in there i could get a little bit more in the weeds of it we'll see we'll check with you see if you got any questions here because this is where i'm going to transition into my next topic but where can you get some more information about entry-level driver training i encourage you all record here this little website okay you've got right here it's tpr fmcsa.dot.gov. This website right here is going to be absolutely critical. Okay, so so like I said, go through, write that down. Make sure that uh, you go to that website. You can also just type into Google, you know, FMCSA ELDT. That that'll pull up the TPR, uh, the training provider website. Be careful whenever you're searching DOT stuff on the internet. That they, wherever there's a real website, there's at least a hundred scams. So don't get wrangled into that 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 stuff. Okay. So before I move on to this next topic, do I have anybody with any questions or anything for me in regards to entry-level driver training? I don't see anything at the moment. I did have someone just ask about the safer record, probably because you went through it, so everybody went out and checked their own <laughs> while you were talking. And someone had said, how do you update that? So... In this case, they said that uh, the system stated they have 28 units. They really have 17. Sure. So is there a way that there an is that, can do that's that? A, that's an MCS 150 update. And that's a that's a an, a topic to teach it. That's going to take me an hour. Um, I have a video on DOT University YouTube channel that, you know, I, I don't know about 
8,000 people have watched it and thanked me for that video. So I do explain it pretty well in that video on my website. So jump in there, take a look at that video. And if they need some help, give me a call. It, it's, it takes us, once we have all the information, it literally is like a five minute process. Do not though, don't, don't go to Google because people will charge you $600, $1,000 and then they'll hijack your DOT number. They'll steal your pen. So don't just give that information out to anybody. If you need some help with it, we can help you. Or you can go to watch my video on DOT University. It's called the MCS 150 update. Um, and, and I will take you through that process, how to update that record step by step. Perfect. And I'm going to put a link to Ryan's DOT University in here as well so that you all oh, thank have you. it. Appreciate that. I didn't He's give got that. Great content on there. So I would tell everyone subscribe to that. Um, just so that you see what else he's got coming out because there's some pretty amazing content there. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that, Kathy. So, okay, again, if you have questions, send them in at any time, but write them down. Some of these are pretty important topics that we have right now. Okay, the next thing I want to talk to you all about is the FMCSA Clearinghouse, right? And this one, yeah, you know what? I know it's been around, you know, since the January of 2020. You know, but when, here's what happened. when When the Clearinghouse hit, it failed, like it dropped. And you gotta think the world was about to turn into chaos, right? It was January 6, 2020. There was all kinds of craziness starting up and everything else just within the next couple months. If I feel like somebody took the world and flipped it upside down and shook it, right? That, that's kind of where we've been in. But when throughout all that, the FMCSA Clearinghouse went live and that whole program flopped like when it first started oh my gosh like you know we were we were for 10 months leading up to the start of this we were standing at the top of the mountains yelling to everybody get registered it's coming you got to be ready when of course everybody waited till january 6th and registered and it uh it collapsed the whole program for about two months and, uh, you know, it got up, and since then, certain parts of the FMCSA have not recovered. I mean, part of that's because of the COVID restrictions. Part of that's because of, uh, you know, just the, the computer. But I will tell you this. The, F, the clearinghouse is up and running. It is live, and there is no excuse for anybody not to be handling their FMCSA clearinghouse. The feds are taking it serious. Violations are rolling out by the dozens um, each day uh, to companies in all states. So you have got to make sure that you're 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 getting on top of this. Right now, clearinghouse violations are not critical or acute. That's good news, okay? But they're probably going to push them to critical or acute after 2023 and there's three years of data in there because it's finding critical really great information and i'm going to show you why the, the clearinghouse is so important so if, if you're hearing about this for the very first time and you don't know what i'm talking about i'm just going to kind of tell you what the clearinghouse was is it is they've been they were talking about the clearinghouse back even when i was building federal programs and working with the feds they were talking about it back in 2005 and it was like oh it's going to come out in two years and then two years will go by and it's going to come out in two more years so in 2020 it finally came out right and what it is is it's going to be a place for cdl drivers um, that test positive or violate the provisions of the dot testing program it, it's going to be a place where they all the positive tests and those those violations are maintained so a cdl driver cannot be hired today unless that driver is first off registered for the clearinghouse so that that's your first check you got to check and make sure that they're in there and then you have to do a pre-employment query in there to make sure that they don't have a positive test or to make sure that they're not prohibited so when we go through and we look at that the the the, the role is is that all cdl driver roles must be registered in the clearinghouse Okay, and each of the companies are required to be also registered, and you have to also select who your third party administrator is. For instance, some of you, like so, I don't know everybody who's listening, some of you might be my clients that are out there and part of my drug and alcohol testing. Our program, we handle clearinghouse for our clients, so it's we, you know, we're going to give you the easy button so you don't even have to worry about it. We deal with that, but just because we do it that way doesn't mean some of the other third party testers do. So again, don't just assume that they're doing it because when you assume that and then you go through an audit and none of that stuff's being done, it doesn't matter your third party provider didn't do it, you're gonna be the one that's in violation. So the second thing is prior to hiring a CDL driver, you as a company have gotta complete a pre-employment 
query on that driver applicant and the driver applicant must provide electronic consent. They literally have to log into their, their, their program and grant you the consent for that pre-employment query. Okay. If they didn't grant you consent, you can't hire them. And I, we deal with this all the time. We get, a company will come to us. They'll, they're like, Hey, we just hired Joe, old Joe, Joe goes to work, but Joe never gave us consent. He, he never, Never granted us consent for that that query, so make sure that you're double checking. Um, if they if they don't grant you consent, don't hire them. You got to ask why. I mean, it's it's this easy. If Joe needs help, I'll be like Joe. Let's meet up, and I will literally help him log into his account. Okay, what's Joe hiding? That's what I want to know. Okay, the next thing that I run into the third bullet point here is annually all CDL drivers are also required to be queried okay uh, within that querying house so at least once a year you can query them more often but you don't need to okay and what that's designed for is that's designed to catch any positive tested drivers that became prohibited through the year maybe maybe you're employing a driver and that driver just goes through and uh, you know tries to get a pre-employment test mid-year Okay, you you haven't selected him for a random because he didn't pop up. You didn't get a reasonable suspicion test on him. But let's say he he used marijuana somewhere. He goes and tries to get another job, and he tests positive in that pre-employment test, so they don't hire him. Well, it's no harm, no no foul for him because he's still got a job with you. So he just comes back, goes to work for you, and then unbeknownst to you, you're using a positive tested driver. Well, this is what the clearinghouse design is designed to catch them because as soon as that driver tested positive for that other company, now that's in the clearinghouse. So now you go through, you run your annual queries, and boom, that driver is found. A driver with a positive test is gonna has to be removed from safety-sensitive function, and they have to go through. The state of Colorado is going to cancel their driving status until they get that and that's that's all the na nationwide is what's going to happen out there so when we go through we look at this program now now i ran these numbers in the clearing house um back in november i i, I haven't pulled them yet uh, for the end of the year uh, to kind of see what those numbers are. I keep telling myself I need to do that and I forget. But here, here's the deal. So we've got the clearinghouse re records that are recorded in here, all for 2020, okay, and 2021 through November. So I don't have December in there. So these are all the numbers that we have, all the positive tests that we can have. So you can see for all the top five that we have out there, we have got the first one is going to be marijuana top and you can see i mean marijuana is the winner by a mile here right i mean that is a lot of positive tests right there total so far in two years fifty-eight thousand. and i'm sure by december rolled around we probably topped 2020's number um in there okay so then we have from there it goes into cocaine methamphetamines and oxymorphone which is uh, another form of uh of uh a, a, opioid okay so when we've got the uh the those are going to be your top your top five drugs total tests out there between two years one hundred and five thousand drivers have had a positive test that means when that driver's knocking on your door he could be one of these now i can tell you right now just within my own drug and alcohol program in the last two years we have put dozens of drivers on this list for these positive tested drivers. So they're not just all out in one area. They're all over the country. So it's so important that when you are hiring somebody, you're doing that pre-employment query to make sure that they're not on that prohibited list. Okay. All right. The next thing, well, when we talk about the total positives, okay, again, we've got those numbers up there. Okay, when we talk about, you know, just a little bit of the return to duty process, because the clearinghouse goes through and it tracks where they're at. If they had a positive test, it'll show you there. If they've been with the SAP evaluation, that's going to be declared on there. If they've had their return to duty test, that's going to be declared on there. And then we have some, um, uh, again, their follow-up testing. So you can see when we come down through here, when you look at the, over here within that report, so we had 100,000 positives. Okay, for CDL holders, prohibited operating status right now, a total of 78,000 still were out there. This was as of uh, December of 2021. Okay, return to duty process, not even started, 58,000 drivers. Substance abuse professional requests sent, there was 1,657. Okay, and it just kind of takes you down through the list. So that tells you how many drivers are still in prohibited status out there and not completed total drivers not completed or of the hundred and some thousand it looks like total of 22,000 have completed the program 
to get back in there that are not prohibited um, of that. So again, when you look at the return to duty process, process, make sure you check and you'll get a whole report, okay? And it'll tell you kind of where they're at and, and in that whole process. So you'll see if they're prohibited, if they're in their SAP evaluation, if they're in the return to duty or if they're in or have completed the follow-up testing. Now registering for the clearinghouse, okay? It, it, if, you, if you got locked out due to portal issues and stuff, I got bad news for you. It's gonna take you a couple days to get it fixed, but you just gotta do it. So what you're gonna do is contact the FMCSA and you're gonna have them wipe out your portal Okay, wipe out your clearinghouse and start over, okay, because if, especially if they're not working. So first thing you do is you log into your FMCSA portal account, okay, and again, I've got videos showing you how to log in and create your portal and stuff like that. Log into your portal, get that created. Now, once you get your portal created, you'll log into it, and you're going to, once you log in, the DACH, Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse Admin Role, you're going to add that. Okay, you have to go into add roles and you're going to start that for your, your login, you're going to start that role. And then it takes 24 hours for the, the two computer systems to link up. After 24 hours, then you go in and you can register for the FMCSA Clearinghouse. You'll put in your information and it'll, it'll boom, it'll auto-populate and you're off to the races. Okay, but you have to go through and follow that procedure, that process. It's very complicated. It takes a couple days and I'm sorry for that. I, yeah, it is what it is. So again, like I said, make sure that you know, you, you're going to commit to doing it, but get your program locked out. If you're not doing the clearinghouse yourself, if your third-party service provider is doing it for you, just check with them to make sure they're doing it correctly, okay? If you need a drug and alcohol service provider, give us a call. We'll, we'll get you hooked up, okay? If we're not right for you, I'll at least give you a referral to a good trusted source. I have friends in the industry and we, we share. I don't take all the business for myself. I, I share it sometimes to somebody else who would be a better fit for a company. So we talk about your portal. This is what your portal login is going to be. You can find it real easy right here. Go to portal dot fmcsa.dot.gov. You can just type in FMCSA portal in the Google search and it'll pop right up. Okay, once you come in here and then it's pretty simple. You can unlock your account, use that, uh, log into it, that kind of thing. If your portal's in good standing and it's working, then just log into it and create that admin role. Okay. Now once you get those admin roles and you wait to 24 hours, the, the DACH, the drug and alcohol clearinghouse admin role assigned to it, then come back in here 20 24 hours later and you're gonna go to the FMCSA clearinghouse click on this register button once you're on that that website okay and then that's going to pop up this screen you enter in your email address your password your drivers who need to register are going to do the same thing they'll come here they'll register once you get past this screen it'll ask you you once you get through this little process when you go to register individually you can register as a company you can register as an individual driver your third party service provider you name it okay but select the right one if a driver needs to register you can help them get registered but but uh, again, like I said, make sure that you do that once that role is, is in there. Okay, once you are registered as a company, make sure you purchase a query plan. plan. Now this query plan, this is really important because when the feds built this program, they put the queries in there, they cost $1.25 each. And they, they built this to where you as the company are the only ones that can purchase the query plan. Now this is what I'm seeing from the scammers. Okay, we, we set it up to where we can log into our companies, our, our clients to help them manage it because we want to give you the easy button for doing this. But what I'm seeing with a lot of the scammers that are out there, once they take control of this, they say they're doing your clearinghouse, they go in and purchase the queries for you once they, they hijack your account and then they charge you double and triple for them, right? So you're paying six, seven dollars a query where they're only a dollar twenty-five each. Okay, the, the queries are a dollar twenty-five. We're not supposed to buy them for you and then jack up the price to you. The Fed said that's the price. That's what each query is supposed to be. Okay, you purchase your queries. You know you can purchase so many of them. Um, you shouldn't really purchase them as you go. Just kind of figure out what you're going to need on an annual basis and and purchase those. Um, they don't give you a discount or anything. Like if you buy a thousand of them, it's a dollar twenty-five each, no matter what. Okay, so pre-employment queries, that's the first one. Prior to hiring somebody, we gotta go through and do that pre-employment query. Okay, the CDL driver in a driving position, 
Okay. If you hire a CDL person and they don't drive for you, then you don't have to do clearinghouse and they don't have to be in your drug and alcohol. But if you put them into a CDL driving role position, they do. So the pre-employment query must be requested by the employer. Next, the driver applicant must log into the clearinghouse. Okay, and they got to grant you consent. So you log into yours, okay, or your third-party provider does that for you. As soon as we request that that entry that that pre-employment query, then that driver will get notified, and they're going to click the link and they're going to log into it. So again, if a driver doesn't log in and doesn't grant us permission to do that, that driver cannot be hired. Okay, now you can only do a pre-employment query once. So if you missed it. You're going to be in some hot water for that. But uh, I, if it's still reasonable, like a reasonable amount of time, like if you just hire somebody a month ago or two months ago, I'd probably still do it. I'd just get them done and just put in writing. We did it late because we went through training today and realized that we messed this up. But I would get them done um, just to make sure they're in there. Okay, the next thing that we're going to go through and do is we're going to review each of those queries and file them. Okay, now it, because we do an, a pre-employment query, it is what you would refer to as a, a full query, right? You get all the information with that. Now, the, the query that you're going to go through and you're going to do annually, that is just a, a limited query. It's not going to show you all the details. It's going to come back and tell you if a driver is prohibited, then you have up to 24 hours to get that driver out of the truck. So if they're out in the middle of nowhere, you don't have to call them up and say, park, and we're going to go get you. You can allow them to bring that truck back, but you have to shut them down from driving if they come back as prohibited within 24 hours while you're figuring that out. Now, once a limited query goes in, comes back prohibited, you've got to instantly request a second query, and that second query has to be a a full query of the driving record, okay? And that means that, that that person, that driver, has to now log back into their account and grant you access. So limited queries, you can use this consent form, okay? And I, I forgot to send this to Kathy to put up on the board today. I apologize. So, Kathy, remind me, and I will send this to you, this little form letter. And you can send this out to everybody. This is the form letter that, that I wrote. I used, I built it off of the template that the feds put out. Um, but you just, like I said, you'll come in, you'll put your company name in here, you fill it out, and then you can do as many limited queries as you want on your drivers. This letter is good for the term of the driver's employment, okay? So limited queries can be done as long as you've got consent written um, on paper and in their file. You can store it in their driver file, you can store it in their drug and alcohol file, or you can store it in their electronic driver file, however you go through and do it. Okay, but an, an, an electronic or a full query has to be granted as an electronic format um, in that system. So again, like I said, um, make sure that you have this, Kathy, I'll send that to you. That, that pretty much takes me to the end of that topic. Y'all, I know I'm overloading you with a huge update. It's been a, a whopping last couple of years with some stuff. Hopefully I'm not giving y'all too much. Does anybody have any questions regarding FMCSA Clearinghouse? I don't see any on that. I am going to take you back one segment, though, to the CDL license. I did have somebody ask if they updated their biennial ahead of the required date. Does that reset the time frame? No, no. So your your DOT number is all, always on a schedule. The the two year. A required update for the MCS 150 and that's always based on the last two digits of your US DOT number so if the last digit or I shouldn't say if the last digit specifies the month so if it, if it's a one it's a it that's January if it's a five that's May if it's a zero that's October um, it so that's the month the second to last digit if that's odd or even, then that specifies the year that you have to do your, your DOT update in. So it never resets it. You just want to make sure that you do your updates, you know, within that within those two years. If you're if you do it just like a month or two early, that's no big deal as long as you had a recent DOT update. I think the I think the biggest deal is just don't give it don't give your DOT number and your PIN number to some scammer. Because they, they do. They you get texts, you get emails, they say they're US DOT authority, you're gonna get a ten thousand are fine unless you pay them six hundred dollars to fix this people fall for that crap all the time don't do that okay i i certainly am not going to charge you six hundred dollars to update your dot number that takes me five minutes to do um so so yeah be careful with that stuff so 
Did that. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see anything else in here right now, and I know you've got another topic to cover, just so my... we'll just keep cruising. All right. My last topic, y'all, my last topic of the day is going to be the hours of service. We had a big, big update uh, in, in uh, the end of 2020, September uh, of 2020. They hit us with the short haul. There was a few other updates in there. Um, but I'm just going to talk about short haul because I think it's what, what pretty much everybody out here working for CDOT is utilizing, okay? And and what's really cool is, is there's an option for both, okay? When I say that, I mean we got an option for CDL drivers and we got an option for non-CDL drivers when it comes to DOT short haul. So each of these would represent what commercial motor vehicles would work. It's just that this is divided, you know, on this half of the, the screen, you know, these are all of my commercial vehicles that would require a, a CDL. We come over to this other screen here, you know, we're dealing with, with commercial vehicles on this side that aren't CDL types. They're just under that 26. They're still commercial vehicles. All this DOT compliance is still required except for the commercial driver's licensing. Now, I did put in the handouts today the flow charts for both CDL and non CDL. If for some reason y'all lose those, you can't get them, they're also available for free on my website. You can download them right there. Now, we talk about the short haul operations. Okay, again, this changed. Now, I'm going to go through, I'm going to show you this in regulation style first. Then we're going to show you what I did to take the flow chart. So regulation then 391.51, 150 air mile radius driver CDL operation. It says the driver operates within 150 air miles. Now that is the equivalent to 172.6 statute miles. So as a crow flies, uh, straight line, I mean driving, where the 150 air mile radius as a crow flies. Okay, I, I'm not, not a real big uh, fan of this 176. I, I think if we live out in flatlands, um, with no curves and no hills, we could probably figure that out. But here in Colorado, we got very windy roads um, and that kind of thing. So, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm more about just going and making an air mile radius map, knowing what my work reporting location is that I get to operate in. Okay. The driver has to return to their work reporting location every day. So when they start their shift, they also have to end their shift at that location. Now, driver has at least 10 consecutive hours off duty separating each 14 hour of on duty so again like i said the driver has at least the, those 10 hours off so you you can work 14 hours you can stay within 150 air mile radius and yeah you, know, you can um you know you you can be out to you have to have 10 hours off between separating your shifts now the last thing is the driver has to have time records okay that time records has to be true and accurate okay now and i'm going to talk more about that time record here in just a minute now the next thing non-cdl drivers is basically the same thing 150 or mile radius okay they got to start and stop at the same work reporting location okay at the end of each tour of duty except for a non-cdl driver gets two options okay during their work week their their five their five 14 hour days they are allowed to have two days that they can go over over 14 but they can't go over 16 and they can still claim short haul now the cdl driver still has what's called as that long day the 16 hour long day which is a great great thing except for with that they have to do if they if they take a long day they go more than 16 then they have to do it what's a logbook a truck driver logbook anytime they go over 14 hours okay so when then your your non-cdl driver still has to have 10 hours off and they have to have uh the true and accurate time records okay now that that's great when you look at it in in the regulations so what i did was i created these flow charts just to help you guys uh, and companies out there understand this short haul has been misinterpreted by many for years and years and years and here's the deal when people look at this they read that regulation and it's fairly long regulation and nobody ever reads it to the bottom Okay, and at the very bottom is where it says you have to have a time record. So, you know, they, they skip that part. So when the DOT comes in here, they're like, oh, we're local. And, you know, we're staying within the 150 air mile radius. And then the DOT says, okay, that's great. Let me see your time records. Everybody's kind of looking around saying, what are you talking about? So what I did was I created this flow chart for you all to, to help you. This is something you would apply every day. And what we're doing, we're going to start at this flow chart. And we're going to apply. We're going to start that. I took the very end of the regulation and I moved it to the very top because if you don't have a time record you're already out of the water you, you've already you're already done why we no need to even continue and then we run into this right here because of this word well i'm on salary i don't have to have a time card well that's great that's between you and your company but in the eyes of the dot 
everybody has to have a time record. They don't discriminate. Everybody has to have a time record, okay? So it, it's, it's that. Now, when I come over here, what is a time record? This is what it has to consist of. Okay, if you hear anything I've talked about today when it comes to hours of service, remember this. Your time record has to consist of three things. It's got to be the time that that driver works, goes to work, the time that that driver leaves work, the total time that that driver was on duty for the day. So if your time record just shows, hey, today, you know, Ryan was working nine hours. Yesterday, Ryan worked 9.5 hours. The day before that, Ryan worked uh, eight and a half hours. The day before that, Ryan worked 10 hours. That is not a true and accurate time record. Your time record has to show these three things, okay? Start time, stop time, total hours of the day and it's not just for time driving i get phone calls every time i talk about this somebody somebody out there that's listening to me calls me up and says okay hey ryan so let me just make sure i understand this so we just have to have this time record every day a driver drives that's not what i'm saying okay your driver has to have a time record every day regardless if they drive or they don't drive because you have to track when it comes to dot rules you got to track your daily hours and you have to track your weekly hours. So you have to have the time card to make sure, especially toward the end of the week, that the driver still has time available to drive and they're not in violation of what's called the 60 or the 70 hour rule, whichever one you're claiming. Okay, so we start here at the top of this one. Do you have a time card? Okay, once we answer yes to that, we're going to come down to this next question. With that, it says, have you stayed, you being the driver, within 150 air mile radius of your work reporting location sure that's a pretty big circle i mean it's i'll show you what it looks like here in a minute okay the next one is gonna be where you released off duty within 14 hours so that means you got to start at one location when you come back to that same location within 14 hours you're released off duty so we say yes and yes and then the last question is have you taken 10 hours off i personally think this is much easier to look at than regulation format and it's a question you answer yes to each one of them if I ever answer no to a single question, that drops me down here. That means I got to do a logbook for that day, and that's absolutely critical because if you don't have a logbook, then that's a missing record of duty status, and that can get you, that can upset your safety record, that can get your drivers put down and put out of service. Okay, so again, be careful. Now, I do have some special notes. That 30-minute rest break rule, that doesn't apply to you when you're using a short haul, and it's it's not 30-minute rest break in or more. It's the interruption of drive time now because you have to have if you're over the road and you're utilizing log books okay it, you have to have for every eight hours of drive time you got to stop and take 30 minutes off um, of doing something else loading doing paperwork something other than driving okay the 60 and 70 hour rule still applies okay um, that's a whole topic in itself if you have questions about 60 or 70 I'll be happy to answer when we get finished up the property carrier sometimes is referred to as the 16 hour long day okay um, you can take that if you're a CDL driver you can take that at least once a, a week in between your resets as long as you were local okay but you have to be off duty within 16 hours and you would have to do a log book for that okay now elds this is really important electronic logging devices okay it's really confusing we have eldt entry-level driver training programs and we have elds electronic logging devices the feds and their dang acronyms okay uh, but we're going to go with eld entry-level driver training okay <laughs> i just said it wrong eld whoo I, I, I hate that they did that. I shouldn't have mentioned it. I got it right the first time. It's going to be electronic logging devices, okay? You can do, your driver can do up to eight paper logs in a 30-day period, and that keeps them out of the electronic logging devices, the ELDs, okay? If they do nine, then they have to do they have to do ELDs, okay? Now, we come to your non-CDL drivers. I'm going to spend a whole lot. I think most of y'all are CDL operations, but just in case, it's the same rule. Remember, we have that 16-hour day is permitted for a non-CDL person. It's permitted two times during the week, and they can get away with that and not have to do that logbook down there on the bottom. But other than that, everything else is exactly the same for your non-CDL drivers. Now, when we talk about the short haul, it's the number one reason of why a company would not have to utilize these electronic log books, okay, um, and papers. But remember, it doesn't totally get you out of it. Remember, there, if you do more than eight in a 30-day period for that single driver, then that driver will have to be in these electronic log books. Now, I tell everybody, and this is kind of a pro tip for you, 
you got to have a time card. Now, if you don't drive every day, then it's really critical that you have this because you're going to have days that you maybe work longer, but you didn't drive a regulated vehicle that day. Now, even though we have to have a time record for that day to show your hours, we can still go through and say that uh, you weren't in violation because let's say you, you worked for 16 hours. You were working on a vehicle at a shop or you were working in the shop or you were getting quotes, whatever the case could be, but we would need a time card. Now, the, the cool thing about this is this goes through, it shows you the driver's name, Again, what pay period it is, we've got to have the date, the power unit number. That's important because if that's not a commercial vehicle or you can put in there not driving and you have a record of that for six months, then I can use that day and say, hey, no, the DOT rules. You, you weren't driving that day. The DOT rules didn't apply to you that day. That's powerful in an audit, especially if you work excessive hours on that day because it's the presumption that you're driving it's going to be up to you to prove that you weren't driving and this is going to be that first step so i got power unit trailer number okay you got your start stop which you absolutely have to have so what do i the minimum i have to have is date start stop of course driver name and then total hours okay so i've i've got that in here but a few bits of information that i've got because this is going to be my pro tip for you. Make sure that you're recording these every day. Now, this log that we're utilizing here, this log or this time record, okay, it's a seven day time record that the drivers would go through and, and keep that. Now, we talk about the. Uh, the 150 air mile radius, when I'm talking specifically about that, you can see just exactly how big that circle is. 150 air mile radius, that's a pretty darn good sized circle right there. Now, when we zoom in on that, just for an example here, we've got that inner circle being that 150 air mile radius. Okay, now this, this was the old rule. 150 or 100 air mile radius. What they did is they expanded that out. So, and they got rid of the 12 hour requirement for for non-cdl drivers now when it comes to this yes you know especially if you're working up north or here in denver you know one of the the questions that i get and even enforcement officers do get this wrong is they say no you're not allowed to be short haul and cross a state line okay uh that is not true that that is total bs um, and so this is perfectly legal if you're Denver, if you go up to Cheyenne, you work up there and come back, okay, as long as you meet all the provisions of short haul, you're good to go. You can, you can operate anywhere within this radius. You can drive as many miles in your 14 hour day, um, that, that you can, uh, again, it is permissible. Okay. One of the questions that I get, somebody will call me up and they'll be like, okay, Ryan, so I'm going to Saratoga. And, uh, you know, your line goes across Saratoga right there, but, you know, I'm, I'm right there on the line, but I'm not exactly real sure where I'm at, you know, specifically. Okay, do, do I need a logbook? Okay, uh, hopefully y'all are laughing at that. These are real questions that I get. And I got to tell you right now, it, 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 look, if you're even remotely touching that line, do a logbook, okay? Um, because it, it's just gonna, if it comes into question, if you don't have a logbook, that's a serious violation in the eyes of the DOT. So make sure you're doing that logbook, okay? All right, I am just about done here. So from there, we got general hours of service rules all still apply. That means you gotta have 10 hours off separating your shift. The 14 hour rule applies, okay? But non-CDL does get the, the two days where they can go over. The 60 hour rule applies as well as the 70 hour rule, okay? And depending, remember, for the 60 hour rules, this is for motor carriers who don't work every day of the week. If, you're, if your company is operational every day of the week, then your drivers can claim 70 hours in eight consecutive days. And then lastly, we have that 16 hour long day. All right, perfect. So that about sums it up. Perfect timing, I think, uh, for the time. Do I have any questions, any comments, any concerns um, out there in the, the land of the Internet world? That was great, by the way. I know it was a lot of information and that you cruised through really quickly, but um, hopefully everybody sort of picked it up. And like I said, we'll send out a recording. So if you need to go back and watch anything again, you'll have that. Um, but now is your time to pick this man's brain. He has just such a wealth of information that he knows that if you have small questions, big questions, now is the time to take advantage of that. We've got about seven minutes left here in class. Um, so feel free to do that. Raise your hand if you want to just take me to take your microphone off mute. You can go ahead and ask the question versus typing it. 
or go ahead and type it in and we'll cruise through that right well and i just throw out there an ad for everybody if you guys you can bounce any questions you got off of me right now um you know i mean now's your chance to get those questions asked anything anything dot whatever you know it doesn't have to be on the topics that we had today so if you've got just a question about anything throw it at me i'll be happy to ch to take a shot at it and see if i can give you an answer so so like i said if if you do have a topic don't be afraid to to jump out there and ask it or if you if you're shy you don't want to do it in front of the group i did give you my contact information feel free to reach out at us at info at frontrangecompliance.com we we i have an open door policy when it comes to questions we're in it for safety how i give back to the industries that support me and my businesses we try to make sure that we keep your questions answered so I have someone had asked uh, if there's several drivers that have not been added to the clearinghouse, can they still be added or do they have to be rehired? No, no, you can still add them. Um, you don't necessarily have to create a list in there. You just have to do the queries on them. So, you know, if uh, depending if you hired them, you know, after January 6th of, of 2020, then you're going to want to do that pre-employment query on them that you should have done, you know, back back when you did it. Um, you can do it as just a full query. You don't have to do the if you know, if you're here now, you can do a query on your drivers at any time. So you're not limited limited to doing um, just a, a full query whenever you want but it does have to be a full query on them if you've never done one so I would definitely if you have drivers that are are in the program that have never been queried I would do a full query on them to get them started and then start them get them in your process of when you do their limited queries and I would do that limited query run I just pick a day every year and I would do it either just on or just before that date, you know, every year, you know, following. I know that's how we do that for our clients. Um, unless you feel like you need to run one, like you catch rumor or something like that, somebody tested positive, um, then you could do a, 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 a limited query at any time because you, you're, you can run queries as often as you want. So I would get them done. I feel like I'm rambling on that answer, but hopefully that answered it. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, uh, we have one here. Someone asked if there are any agriculture exemptions for hours of service, yeah. such as harvest. There is. So during during planting and harvesting seasons, so the state of Colorado years ago went in and changed planting and harvesting ser uh, to uh, to year round. Uh, before that, it was you know the the enforcement people had to go through and figure out oh they're moving corn. Is it time for planting and harvesting? And you called the the Colorado Department of Agriculture and nobody knew what those times were. So we just went through and we we actually pushed to just say look if you're involved in any type of planting and harvesting. Uh, year round there's an agricultural exemption now, of course it is limited to 150 air mile radius so if you're driving from where you start your shift if you drive more than 150 air miles then yes you're going to uh, have to adhere to DOT rules but as long as you're doing all your agricultural operations and not just planting and harvesting if, if you're doing if you're like working for the farm you're the farmer yourself you're doing exactly farm related activities such as hauling ag products or ag machinery whatever the case it is you're going to be exempt from hours of service as long as all that is done within that 150 air mile radius go more than 150 air mile radius and all bets are off then you have to have well you for ag you have to have pretty much all dot compliant compliance past 150 miles all right um and then someone had asked here let's see if you drive a dump truck in the city how many hours can you drive a day so well, i guess it's within yep. that 150 mile radius yep. yeah yep so you're you get 14 hours so when you're short haul you don't have to track your driving hours so you're not going to be limited you know where if you're not doing short haul you're limited to 11 hours of driving in every 14 hour shift you can only drive for for the 11 hours but when you're short haul you get a 14 hour work day and you can drive within that time frame you're not required to track your driving when you're short haul you just have to have the time record that shows the time you start working in the morning the time you stop working in the evening and your total hours okay uh someone asked if there's an agency is there an agency that someone might report my company to if we're behind on maintenance or trucks are out of compliance or is that only a risk if we get a roadside inspection no that's a really great question actually so yes 
anybody can be a whistleblower. Um, in fact, I think the feds and the states encourage whistleblowing. So, yeah, absolutely. If, uh, if, if you have a disgruntled employee, uh, somebody you've terminated, um, or somebody that uh, is still working for you but just is just tired of the way things are going, they can, they can contact the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. They can contact the Colorado State Patrol, and they can formulate a complaint, and all complaints are investigated. So, so it could be an investigation where they just send a trooper out to sit down and talk to you to find out what's going on to substantiate you know, the, uh, the claim. Um, or they could say, hey, we're going to go out and do a full-blown audit on that company. So absolutely, you, you do need to worry about complaints from disgruntled employees because they will get um, absolutely 100% investigated. The rest of this, the program is, is like audits are run typically off of your on-road performance. So if you are... If you just go over the threshold and, and, and you're just over the threshold for a month, you're going to get a warning letter from the feds telling you that you're over the threshold, you need to fix things, and hopefully the actions you take bring you under. But oftentimes when you go over a threshold, you're not going to see an improvement on that for sometimes over a year. When you are over a threshold and those basics, right, and you get the, the alerting warning, when you're over a threshold and in danger of an audit, okay, for over a year, you're you you're in jeopardy of an audit when you're over the threshold for two years straight you're guaranteed an audit um and and an auditor is going to be coming in there so again it, it takes about a year and a half sometimes to clean those numbers up assuming that we're getting good clean inspections and no more bad inspections but again the goal is is just to get on top of that maintenance program so that we don't have those issues Excellent. I had someone here also ask about um, Spanish speakers who need this type of information or training. Do you have anyone at your company that's bilingual or do you offer any training or no resources uh, where it would be in Spanish? I, I Unfortunately, I do not have a Spanish speaking employee. I've been trying to find somebody for, for quite some time. Um, and and I, I do a lot of work with Spanish speaking companies and, and drivers. I do a lot of training with, with those individuals where we bring an interpreter in and I talk and, and they interpret. Unfortunately, my Spanish is just enough to, to probably get me a drink or get me punched in the face, that, that kind of thing. Um, it's one of those things I would, I would love to learn. And I, I think we need these resources out there for our, our uh, Hispanic owned trucking company, um, trucking companies that are out here, because uh, unfortunately I, I believe that, that they get taken advantage of quite often and they, they just need a really good resource out there. So I am, I, I personally have been looking for a Spanish speaking employee and, and hopefully we can get somebody here in the near future and get that. There are not a lot of resources out there. And unfortunately some of the people that do take advantage. Okay, thanks. Um, looking to see if I have any others that I haven't caught. I know someone gave you a, uh, a glowing endorsement and said they didn't have a question, but they want to thank Ryan for his expertise. He's a great resource that's helped me on several occasions, a lot of time on the spot. So uh, oh, we good. do greatly appreciate everything you. that you share, especially here at a free training class uh, to offer folks at least the, the high level of all of this. If you have a CDL class B, can you upgrade without going to school? You and you cannot not not after uh, February seventh. So if you want to get an upgrade to a from a class B to a class A, that is also going to require the entry level driver training. Um, that I think where I don't want to keep you too long here. I I just want to make sure everyone knows that you can contact Ryan directly. Um, you can retain his company to help with a lot of the things that they're talking about. Uh, he's a great resource for that. And I would encourage you to leverage his expertise as much as possible. Um, so that's my other endorsement for, for Appreciate you. Appreciate that, I just know much. I send a lot of folks to you too, just because every time we have this class, I am amazed by how much information you know and, and you've made us doing greatest. So oh, well, thank you. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your time today. So thanks everyone. Thank you again so much, Ryan. Really appreciate you as always. And uh, we look forward to seeing y'all again soon. All right. Thank you. All right. Y'all be safe care, out everyone. there. Yep.